Good evening. Our text this evening comes from Haggai chapter 2, verse 20. Haggai chapter 2, verse 20. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you declares the Lord of hosts. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with this word from your servant, the prophet Haggai. We pray that you will be with us as we consider these words, open our minds and hearts to your scriptures, grant us understanding and diligence in application, that we might be better servants in your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So this last oracle of Haggai is pretty short, um, but it speaks to something very important. Um, God is giving Zerubbabel you know, his, his long-term vision. But most of the, uh, the book of Haggai has had to do with uh, this crisis about the rebuilding of the temple and how Judah has not been faithful in doing it and what the consequences of that are. Um, and then what, uh, what happens after they have obeyed? And then, you know, teaching an object lesson about, uh, about that in terms of cleanliness and uncleanness. But then you get to this last oracle, and God is looking out, as it were, or inviting Zerubbabel to look out, that no longer is the subject... This, this local crisis of obedience just among the people, but God is revealing to Zerubbabel that he has some big plans. And it all focuses around this one man, this, this figure whose name we have read a few times in this book, somebody that we don't often talk about in, uh, in our assemblies, in our lessons, in devotions, this man, Zerubbabel. He is more than just a funny name. The Lord singles him out for this great promise that he makes. The Lord says he is about to change the world. I am about to shake the heavens and the earth, God says. He's going to change the world. And Zerubbabel is going to be a key part of it. And in the course of shaking things up, he's going to be completely changing who's in control of things. And in the end, after everything is settled, the Lord says, I will make you like a signet ring, Zerubbabel. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. So today, I, I want us to consider... God's promises, his plans for history. And I want to consider this especially through the light of Zerubbabel because I think there is something that we can learn from Zerubbabel uh, in a way that's maybe more difficult for us to learn from other biblical figures. But the first thing I want us to consider through these promises is something that we we talk about this a lot, that God asserts his control over history. He says, I'm I'm going to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. I want us to remember the situation that the people of Judah are in. They're back in the land. 
and now even the temple is rebuilt, but they are still not their own people. They're not an independent nation. They are an imperial province of Persia. And things are better for Judah than they had been. They had been captives in Babylon. And the only ones who had been left behind uh, were basically the poorest of the land just to maintain the land, keep it from being empty. But basically everyone else had been carried off into Babylon. Well, once the Medes and the Persians overthrew the Babylonians, or Cyrus the Great decrees that the people of Judah are allowed to return to their homes. And so things are better for them. They are back in Judah. They're back in the Promised Land. But things still aren't good. All right, we could go back to, to Nehemiah and especially to Ezra and read uh, that the, the situation with the temple that we read about in Haggai, it's not just a matter of their disobedience, or Haggai tackles their disobedience, but it's also a matter of there's a lot of drama going on around them. There are people opposing them. There are people oppressing them. And so even though Judah's back in the land, they're not their own people. And the people over them uh, don't always have their best interests at heart. Right? The powerful seem to be in power. They're just the way it always looks. Uh, greedy, self-interested people have all the power, and it seems like they are in control. But God tells Zerubbabel that he, the Lord, is really the one in control. Right, imagine the earth like a snow globe. All right, God says he's going to take that snow globe and he's going to shake it around. And all of these powerful kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians, just like the Babylonians before them and just like the Greeks after them, these mighty kingdoms, they're just little snowmen in the snow globe <clears throat> compared to God. And whenever God promises Zerubbabel that he's going to lay the nations low, what that means is the restoration of Judah. That means Israel coming back into its own. And so we see God asserting his control over history, asserting his control over the world. And we also see God revealing to Judah... Uh, the promise of deliverance. We know that these promises are ultimately a messianic promise. That through this oracle, Judah comes to look forward to the Messiah. And that these promises are ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Hey, if you turn to Matthew chapter 1, not too many pages over from where we're at in Haggai. Matthew is laying out uh, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, that he is son of David and son of Abraham. So he's bearing all of these promises given to Abraham and to David. And part of that lineage, so he, he's trace, he traces the lineage down from Abraham through David down to Jesus and showing that God has been building towards the fulfillment of all of these promises. And in the midst of that, we read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 12, after the deportation to Babylon, we have Jeconiah, uh, who was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, Abiud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Messiah, Christ. 
the Messiah is the descendant of this Zerubbabel. And he fulfills the promise that Zerubbabel will be like a signet ring. You know, the signet ring is a symbol of authority. That whenever God sets things straight and, and asserts his power and control over the world, he's going to do that um, the way that, that other kings do. Or at least that's the image he gives us. He has a signet ring. He makes his decrees. He puts his stamp on things, as it were. God is telling Zerubbabel that he will exercise his authority through him. And that ultimately comes to pass in Jesus, his descendant, the Messiah. And God's promise to cast down the nations is also ultimately fulfilled through Jesus. I want us to recall uh, something that, um, that the father of John uh, the, the other Zechariah, <clears throat> something that he prays uh, on the occasion of the birth of John. In Luke chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 68. So this is Zechariah, the priest, the father of John the Baptist, prophesying. In Luke chapter 1, verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to, her, to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercies of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. He recognizes in the birth of his son, John, that God is on the cusp of fulfilling all of these promises and that that fulfillment will happen through the descendant of the house of David. Uh, Jesus, whom... He knows his wife's cousin is bearing. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, uh, uh, he's prophesying that all of these things are coming true. That through Jesus, we will be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us. And so God asserts his control, he makes his promises, and he fulfills those promises ultimately through Jesus. All of that is bound up in this short oracle delivered to Zerubbabel. But I want us, for the remainder of our time this evening, to turn our attention to Zerubbabel himself for a bit. Because I think there's a lesson for us to learn in the experience of this man. Uh, because it is very easy for us to come to a man like Zerubbabel and do what we just did, which is talk about all of this fulfillment that takes place nowhere near Zerubbabel. I want us to think something through this evening. Who is Zerubbabel? He is, as we read, we've read this a few times in our text tonight, or in Haggai. We read it in our text tonight as well. Uh, the Lord says, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. Governor of Judah. Remember, Zerubbabel is a descendant of David. In ideal circumstances, or maybe we, we could even lighten that down a bit and say normal circumstances. What would that make him? 
If he's descendant of King David, then what's that make Zerubbabel? Should make him king of Judah and of Israel. But who is he in his day? He's governor of Judah. And as far as we know, he dies as governor of Judah. And I want us to think this through for a minute. What does that mean for Zerubbabel's place in all of these things that we've been talking about? What it means for him to be governor of Judah is that he is a, he's a lesser official in the empire of Persia. He's, he's been appointed to this post. One of the kings of Persia, probably Cyrus, put him in this position, and he is to govern the imperial province of Judah for the benefit of the king, the king of Persia. When Zerubbabel himself carries royal blood and himself ought to be called king, but he is governor. Again, as far as we know, his whole life. <clears throat> Put yourself in Zerubbabel's shoes for a moment. <clears throat> the prophet of the Lord has come to you personally, you by name. Imagine you have a funny sounding name for a minute. He tells you that the Lord says he's going to change the world. He's going to shake heaven and earth, cast down the mighty, and you are going to be the symbol of his authority. You are the signet ring, because you're the descendant of King David. You come from royal stock. What kind of future might you imagine for yourself if the prophet of the Lord comes to you and says, God's going to shake heaven and earth, he's going to cast down the nations, you are going to be the signet ring. What do you think your life is going to look like just a little bit down the road? What does your future hold, do you think? Probably got pretty high expectations. Because God is promising. These, these people that you serve in Persia, they're going to be cast down. You're not going to be governor of Judah anymore. You're going to be the signet ring. You're going to be king of Judah, king of Israel. Now imagine having those expectations and a year passes and nothing happens. You're still governor of Judah. That's all right. You know, God works in his own time. <clears throat> and another year passes and another year. Before you know it, a decade has passed and you're still governor of Judah. Persia is still in power. And you spend the rest of your life, year after year, waiting, having the expectation of this promise on you, and finally you die. Governor of Judah. Nothing has changed. Persia is still in control, and now you're dead. Zerubbabel was not the only person in Israel that this kind of thing happened to. And again, just to, to drive home the, uh, perhaps the, the level of disappointment that one might feel over the, the life of Zerubbabel. Like we've been saying all through this message, this is a man that we never talk about. How many, how many studies on Zerubbabel have you attended in your time as a Christian? How many Zerubbabel devotions do you see sitting around at the bookstore? Again, we just think of him as a guy with a funny sounding name. This man who was promised everything and did not receive it, at least in this life. And he is not the only one. Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 39. 
There we read, in, in Hebrews 11, we read of many more people whose names we know better. People who do have devotions written about them. Men like Abraham and Moses. A few of the judges. But we read at the end of this long chain of, of faithful individuals, in Hebrews 11, verse 39, all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. I want us to consider something. What, what do we make of this? The, the way that God's promise plays out. And I don't just mean in terms of all of these faithful men and women, from, you know, for lack of a better term, from the Old Testament. What do we make of this for ourselves? Because consider that in Christ, we have received the fulfillment of all of these promises made to Zerubbabel and Abraham and David and Moses and Samuel and all the rest of these people. In Christ, we've re those promises have been fulfilled, and we get to enjoy the fulfillment of those promises. But along with Christ comes new promises that have not yet been fulfilled. And so we find ourselves in the same boat, that we are waiting on the fulfillment of promises just like Zerubbabel was. We have a, we have a habit, I think it's a good one, of any time that we offer the invitation, we usually make it a matter of urgency. You don't know how long you've got left. God could come back to, you know, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. God could come back today. You know, the, the Lord could come back before the end of this sermon. It could happen now. And the question is, are you ready for that? It's a question that we ask those who have not obeyed the gospel. I want to flip that on its head for a second and consider it maybe from the other direction. <clears throat> it is entirely possible you know, for those of us who have obeyed the gospel and are waiting on the promises of Jesus Christ, it is entirely possible that our life will play out much like Zerubbabel's did. That just as, it, as happened to Zerubbabel, God's plans might outlive us too. All right, the Lord's promise might not be fulfilled today or tomorrow or this year or next year or at any point during your life and you might die waiting to receive the promises those of us who have obeyed the gospel are we ready for that are we ready to live a life like Zerubbabel To go through life, not receive these promises in this life, die and more or less be forgotten to become just another funny name. Now, of course, none of this means that, God, that, that God's promise fails. Right? The, the promises that God made to Zerubbabel were fulfilled, and he will fulfill his promises for us too. But we have to accept that we might not receive them in this life. Uh, that we might be waiting a very long time. We join men like Zerubbabel in our faith. In fact, that's what the Hebrew writer invites us to do. Right after that passage we read, um, in Hebrews chapter 12, he invites us to join this great cloud of witnesses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance 
the race that is set before us. As we share the same faith as Zerubbabel, and we express that faith as Zerubbabel did by waiting. One day, all of God's promises will come about, and on that day, we will be joined with Zerubbabel and many others in the resurrection. Everything that we've been talking about here, we'll get to talk about with him. And so the question is, are we prepared to wait? We urge everyone to obey the good news of Jesus Christ. To lay hold of these promises that we've been talking about. You do that by turning away from sin, from the ways of this world, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, being baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins, and then waiting on the hope of Christ's coming. If you have not obeyed the gospel, we urge you to do so now. Make your need known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.